Welcome to the Interesting Podcast, episode number 54. This episode is ABC correspondent Clayton Sandell. Sorry, I, I couldn't help it. When you have a correspondent on, you know, you got to do the radio announcer voice for reasons. Uh, Clayton's awesome. Never had a reporter on or a correspondent, which is a fancy term. We cover that uh, in this. Uh, and he's a blast. He's a super fun dude. Um, we talk about drive-in theaters, uh, him working in radio which is pretty interesting. Uh, his move to D.C., covering politics. He was on a Coast Guard icebreaker, which already sounds really cool, even if you have no context for it, but he breaks down how it works, and I had no idea, and uh, I'm for it. It sounds amazing. But we cover all kinds of stuff, crazy situations he's uh, reported on and, and been in. Um, and then we talk about how he is like the resident Star Wars fan. At ABC, so he's he's figured out a way to uh, make that work for him, which is the best. Um, he talk about him going to Lucasfilm, um, Skywalker Ranch, and then we cover uh, this documentary that he just put out recently called "The Force of Sound," which is so good. I cannot recommend it enough. Um, it talks about the sound that went into uh, Episode Eight, The Last Jedi. Um, and it's just, it's so cool. We, we talk about the Franken gun, um, which you'll learn about in this. And uh, just all kinds of stuff. Clayton's a good dude. Um, this was really, really fun. So uh, I'm going to stop talking. <laughs> Let you guys enjoy uh, the interesting podcast, episode number 54, with Clayton Sandell. Roll the theme song. Hanging in there. It's uh, it's nice. It's Thursday night, getting toward the end of the week. That's it's right. all good. That's right. How's your boy? Yeah. He's good. We had uh, our first follow up appointment today, so he had uh, uh, just some X rays and had a permanent cat or uh, a more permanent cast <clears throat> uh, put on. He had kind of a, a temporary one. They had to wait for the swelling to go down. So they uh, now that that's all good, he's uh, he's got his fresh. New royal blue cast, and he's ready to go. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Ready for signatures. Yeah. Ready for signatures. Yes, exactly. How you doing? I'm All doing good? great. Doing great. Yep. I've I've never broken my leg, so that's good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Have that you? would be. Have you ever broken anything? No, I've never broken anything. I uh, lucky. I, I think I broke a toe when I was like twelve. Uh, I was like really excited that we were going on vacation, and I like jumped <laughs> off of my bed and, and broke my toe, and and didn't tell my parents. It's like it was like walking around on vacation just in agonizing pain, but it was fun. <laughs> you know, but... yeah, worth it. Worth it. I'm crying because I'm happy. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Happy to be here. That is here. that is yeah. awesome. Are you okay? So you're you're not in California. You're in Denver. Yeah, I'm in Denver. Okay, yep. I'm glad yep. I knew that ahead of time because when we we're like seven o'clock your time, I was like, oh no, he's every, oh, yeah, he's yeah. everywhere. What time zone would he be in? Luckily, I found yep. out. No, nope, you got it. Yeah, yeah. Good you're old Denver. good old Denver tonight. Yeah. You're not from there though. No, I actually grew up in uh, in Southern California. In uh, yeah. yeah. What part? In Riverside. Riverside, actually, which is interesting because uh, I was listening to your Hal Hickel show. Yeah, love that guy. And uh, Hal is also uh, from Riverside, California. In fact, we, uh, we, we've we chatted a little bit on, on Twitter about uh, the drive-in that we used to both go to as kids, which, interestingly enough, is still open and operating as a drive through What? Is it really? Yeah, on Van Buren Boulevard in Riverside, um, still does still does first run movies. I think it's got to be one of the few left in Southern California. But I remember seeing all kinds of movies there as a kid. Sure, I bet it's one of the few left in the world. <laughs> yes, we had we had one here, I believe, and I went to it maybe three times. I live in Naples, Florida, which is like mm-hmm. southwest, directly across from Miami. 
Like if you went mm-hmm. to Miami and just went to the opposite coast, it's there. And uh, <laughs> drive-in, drive-in, such. A, can you imagine trying to explain drive-in theaters like ten years from now to children? Like you listen no, to it on the not radio. At all. <laughs> though, though I can I can see the appeal though for kids today like like my daughter who's fourteen uh, you know with smartphones and wanting to text and Snapchat and all of that during the movie like they could do that during <laughs> sure. during a drive-in movie so maybe maybe these maybe these millennials will bring uh, drive-ins back who knows that's right they didn't even realize the appeal you can't, exactly <laughs> your 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 phone isn't blasting the car next to you. Exactly right. I remember yeah. watching a movie, and then we had like a screen in front of us, and then in the lot behind us there was another screen. So you could like, if you ever got bored with the movie you were watching, you can turn around and watch the movie across from you. I mean, obviously the sound doesn't add up, but you're like, hmm, I wonder what's going on over there. Oh yeah, yeah. Maybe <laughs> and, maybe I'll see that next week. Yeah. Exactly. I remember watching. Uh, I think it was X Men. Maybe it was the one that I went there for. But then I looked behind me, and they were playing scary movie. And if you just have, like, a woman in her underwear running away from Scream with a banana, you're like, out of context with no sound, I, I don't know what to do with this. <laughs> yeah, completely. Yeah, 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 exactly. That's funny. So strange. Very so strange. Good. So when did you leave Riverside? You were there for a while, I'm assuming. Uh, yeah, so so I grew up there um, and actually uh, went to college there. I, I went to the University of California, Riverside. I was a poli-sci major. And uh, yeah, makes sense. after graduating, my uh, uh, I had a chance to take a job in Washington, D.C., which uh, there was no reason not to take it. And so we kind of just made this complete and total leap of faith and moved cross country my girlfriend at the time and I and then uh, probably 7 or 8 months later we got engaged right on while we while we were there and uh we've been together ever since there you go i'm getting married next Two month what and... tips you got oh congratulations nice thank you. thank you tips tips i'm listening oh man uh just just say yes honey just yeah. say yes honey. All the time. It's good. no it's Fair. just you know you, you got to be friends you got to be partners and uh sort of equal shares and everything and and it's all good it's worked out we've got two great kids now and uh sure and what it's been a great like? it's been a great ride yeah there you go that is awesome yeah. we're so Growing up in Riverside and then you went the jump to Washington, D.C., was journalism something you were always interested in? You know, I um, I am one of those people who always kind of knew that I wanted to work in media. And, and, and uh-huh. I didn't know what and I, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I didn't know how to do any of it. But, um, you know, part of it com- comes from having watched all of these behind-the-scenes uh, documentaries and features on oh, Star yes. Wars and other things as a kid. Like, I always knew that I wanted to work in films or television or, or broadcasting in some fashion, mm-hmm. and uh, I was just sort of aimless. I just I didn't know what I wanted to do. And, um, you know, so, so going to school, as I was in college, I, I did radio in Southern California, news radio, and... Uh, what you did radio? Uh, yeah, I actually started in radio. Uh, my first, my first official job was in radio, though I got paid like nothing. But I, um, yeah, I was a DJ at a uh, a public radio station in Temecula, California. Really? Um, I was kind of going to school. I was working. Um, uh, at, at the time, I thought I wanted to be a helicopter pilot, so I was also working at a helicopter company just in the office. I wasn't a pilot or anything like that, but uh, what we had a we had a yeah, I was down in uh, French Valley Airport in Southern California, so I was doing helicopter stuff, thinking that one day I was going to be a professional helicopter pilot, and then I got this job doing radio like two days a week for four hour shifts, uh, which were totally different because one was a Saturday night shift, which was you know, kind of fun. It was like an adult contemporary station, so you could kind of play whatever you wanted, fun, for, you know, Saturday night kind of music. And then uh, the the Sunday morning shift was, you know, like brunch, you know, it had to be much lower key. I got into trouble once for playing a, a rock song that was much too, much too inappropriate for the Sunday morning crowd. So, yeah, I, I did that for a while. And then I did uh, news radio at a station in San Bernardino. And that kind of led to uh, doing stringing work for, uh, at the time, it's it's unfortunately out of commission now, but it was uh, KFWB News 98 Radio in Southern California. And it was, at the time, it was the only 24-hour uh, radio news station 
in L.A. And uh, wow. <clears throat> there was another there was another one that's still there, KNX. But KNX would do like baseball games and things like that. So we had the distinction of being the only twenty four hour news radio station. So yeah, I covered. Uh, Riverside and San Bernardino counties and uh, kind of did all sorts of breaking news, ran around with my police scanner and my tape recorder and yes, uh, my microphone and uh, had a blast. I mean, it was great for being, you know, single in my 20s and, and no life. So I would I would run around <laughs> chasing the police scanner, uh, which was fun. Sure. It's um, all, all part of it. It's all part of it. When you so yeah, when, when you're so. being a DJ, did you have. What are they called? Bumpers or like the lead in? You know, you've got like 10, 15 seconds before the song. We are like, hey, welcome to this. Yes, exactly. Up. Right, right, right. How, so, long, how long did that take you to get the hang of that? You know, it was um, what made it easier is that it was a, uh, a like a computer based system. So you would you would start the song and there was a, a, a countdown timer. And oh. so you would know you would know exactly how much time you had. So you'd watch it and you'd, you know, say your thing. You'd get you'd give your little weather report or your whatever. And then uh, and then uh, get out of it just in time for the <laughs> lyrics to start or for for whatever. But um yeah, it was uh sounds pretty awesome. It, it was awesome. It, it was great. It was, you know, it was a, a tiny little station like like I said in Temecula, I think yeah. about 3 people listened at any given time, but it was a great <laughs> place. Like any first job, any first um uh, experience like that, it's a good place to to make your mistakes, to screw up, to do all these things that uh uh, you know when nobody's when nobody's really listening, and you learn these really valuable lessons about not hitting certain buttons. I did once turn around <laughs> thinking I was uh, resetting um, the computer or something once, and I ended up shutting down the entire computer system that played oh, the auto no. that played the music. So uh, so nothing would play. We was just got <laughs> complete complete dead air until I could rush out of the air studio, grab any random CD out of the rack that happened to be out there and run it back in, cue up a song that made sense, you know, sure. and, uh, and, and get it playing. So after that happened the first time and you went through like, you know, 90 seconds of dead air and the phone starts to ring and your, <laughs> your program director is screaming at you, uh, you, you learn to have a song, uh, uh, plugged in and, and ready to go. So I would always pick a long song just in case something really bad Smart. happened. And I think, Smart. yeah, yeah. So had that all queued up, but yeah, it was a great, it was a great experience. It was a lot of fun. And uh, yeah, it was, it was cool. I always wonder about radio. Cause like on one side, it sounds like the best job ever where it's just super fun all the time. But then it also sounds like it could be the worst job. Did you ever have anybody <laughs> like, did you ever have any crazy calls? As a DJ, like people calling in, uh, I didn't have I didn't have any crazy callers. Um, we had a lot of kids that would call in. Um, there were occasionally one or two people that were out there that, uh, uh, quite honestly, just just sounded lonely, and they would call oh, in no. and 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 chat uh, and want to chat a lot. Uh, but sure. no, no, nobody ever really, nobody ever really crazy, and I didn't do it for that long. It was probably only about six or seven months, and. Uh, and yeah, then I moved call. on to the to the news radio station. But um, sure, sure. So what made you yeah, jump, what made uh, you jump from like music to news? Because that's two very different things. Yeah, I think it just kind of fit my own personality uh, better. You know, I, I don't think I'm I'm the type of personality that's like the wacky morning zoo, oh, yeah. you know, kind of <laughs> dude. I, I I'm much. Yeah, no cowbells, none of that. I, I, I'm much more, uh, I like being out there and chasing the story. And, and, you know, I was always the kid that wanted to know where the, where the cop cars were going and where the fire trucks were rolling to. And so sure, kind of wanted to be in the center of the action, you know, and, and that course. sort of thing. So, so I think that's kind of what drew me to news. And, uh, I was lucky in that, you know, growing up in Southern California, it's it's even being way out in Riverside, which is like 60 miles east of L.A., you still are watching L.A. TV stations and listening sure. to L.A. radio stations. And so growing up, you had some of the best, uh, you, know, you know, talents in the market. Uh, which was which was neat. Uh, you had a lot of people to look up to. And then when I started doing more radio news, it was fun because I was now running into news news uh, reporters that I'd grown up watching sure. uh, now covering the same story that I was, which was really fun. There was a guy named Bob Banfield 
who worked in the Inland Empire Bureau for uh, for KABC for many many years, and it was really uh, it was really fun to show up on the same stories that he would, and I and I would, you know, I was totally green. I had no idea what I was doing, <laughs> but it was like such a cool feeling to you know write a story, pick a soundbite, and then listen or watch the news later in the day when Bob Banfield was on and see, oh, Bob, Bob picked the same soundbite from the news conference that I did. That's so cool. Yeah. It was kind of, <laughs> we're basically best friends fun. now. <laughs> we're basically best friends. Yeah. Yeah. So when your heroes become colleagues. Yes, exactly. Yeah. That, that is fun. awesome. Yeah. It'd be, pr- it'd be kind of neat. I did read somewhere on the internet that, uh, <laughs> you made space documentaries. That's pretty awesome. Yeah, yeah. So that was fun. So after the um, kind of a, kind of when I was starting out in radio, still going to school, I went to. Uh, I had a friend who had a. He worked at this production company that was this family owned uh, production company, still around, called Finley Holiday Films, and they did. You know, anytime you drove through Yellowstone or the Grand Canyon or Yosemite and went to the gift shop and saw the old VHS tapes of you know tour yellowstone or whatever it was Mm -hmm. they they were one of the two really one of the two biggest companies that did those kinds of videos um and so i started working for them and it was very small so we ended up doing everything you you would write you would edit you would um uh you know do we do the soundtracks we had we uh uh, you know, music libraries. I would I would help pick the music for things, and then I started to to write a little bit more and produce more. We'd do all of our own graphics. Like it was, you got a you got hands on everything, and so it was really fun to to uh, I, I I still use some of those editing. I do I do some some editing of some of my stuff uh, to this day uh, using those skills. So that was really cool. So yeah, we did we did all these national park things, and then we did. Um, space documentaries we worked with uh like jpl nasa and uh we we do uh gosh all sorts of things like tour of the solar system and i did i did one that actually kind of led to my job at abc which was uh on on the planet mars it was a just a like a 45 minute um documentary on the history of mars exploration using all the old nasa footage and the uh, you know, all the great images that the, the orbiters and the landers would take. And so, uh, I did that video and, uh, it, it won, uh, an award from something called the, from Cine, uh, the Cine Awards. Mm -hmm. And you're going to ask me what that stands for. And it's like the council on non international non-theatrical events or something like that, but it's C-I-N-E. Uh, and so they, uh, we won an award, I think, in the science and technology category. And so I went to Washington, D.C. And while I was there, um, uh, went in for an interview at ABC. And then about uh, six or seven months later, they asked me if I'd like to come and work on the assignment desk. So that was the uh, that was what led to uh, going all the way cross country was that space documentary. That's pretty amazing how this all like the paths. That's pretty much what the show has turned into with the, with my yeah. podcast. The paths that people take, like like you mentioned, you listen well, to Hal's episode and it's mm-hmm. nuts. And yours the same way. I like that you had this feeling. You're like, <laughs> I feel like the media, and then you just kind of take the path, and then boom, yeah, you're working for ABC. It, and then you get really you get really lucky, and there are these these moments I can look back on where if I had been two minutes later. Or two minutes earlier, if I'd uh, hit that red light, I wouldn't have run into my friend who had the production company who was happened to be hiring at that time. And, and you know, oh, yeah. it's it's weird how things just sort of fall into place and seem to sometimes be meant to be. And, uh, uh, you know, you, you just feel fortunate that you were in the right place at the right time. You know, it's it's half skill, uh, but a heck of a lot of luck, too. So, oh, yeah. <laughs> it's, kind of a it has been a, a crazy path when i think about it um right but it, but then you yeah. look at the through line and it all kind of makes sense too yeah it all kind of makes sense it yeah. all kind of makes sense i love it i love it so as a as a poli sci major then you're in dc you know the the hub of it all how yeah the, how was that be, it, like reporting from there at the source it was uh it was really Incredible. It was it was one of the most interesting news decades that we were there. I mean, we got there in 2000 and uh, 
it, of course, in nine uh, eleven hit, uh, and we, you know, a little yeah, over a year geez. after us being there, and we're like, oh my gosh, what what do we get ourselves into? Sure. Um, so we kind of had this this front row seat to um, an incredible time in in Washington D.C. But uh, but I loved it. You know, we I did uh, I I produced for Sam Donaldson had a uh, a daily webcast that he did. Uh, every day, it, was, it had to be one of the earliest daily uh, webcasts online that uh, that anybody uh, was doing. And we did it five days a week, live, using a huge studio crew. Like today, if you were to do a live webcast, you'd do it like on your iPhone or with two yeah, people. For sure. Uh, and and back in the day, we were using like a full on studio crew and a full on control room, and it was crazy. We had all these people, and and it was great. Sam did like this talk show every day, and it was at the same time he was hosting uh, this week with Koki Roberts. So, uh, so it was really cool. We got to do a lot of fun things and and interview a lot of cool guests, and uh, that webcast kind of then later turned into a radio show. So I kind of went back to doing radio, and I was actually running the board during the show and Dude. recording and editing interviews and the commercial breaks, and it was pretty hectic and crazy. But uh, but I loved it, and we did that for a couple of years, and then uh, I went to uh, World News Tonight with Peter Jennings um, as an associate producer. So I was kind of like an assistant producer, I, and I, I started that right before uh, we invaded Iraq in 2003. So yeah. Stayed there at World News, worked my way up. I stayed there till uh, 2009, all all behind the scenes as a, as a producer. Of but, course, uh, of course. Got to do a lot of really, I mean, I worked with the best people in the business in terms of producers and correspondents. Learned a lot, um, and uh, and you know that the, the the job sent me around the world. I ended up uh, taking on climate change uh, sort of as a beat. I was working with. Uh, Climate change and science with a couple different correspondents, uh, Ned Potter and Bill Blakemore, and uh, that part of it took me to like Greenland and the Arctic Circle and and driving through the ice on Coast Guard icebreakers and yeah. uh, shooting all these great uh, stories that were that were very. Uh, it was be, being on a Coast Guard icebreaker uh, in the middle of the Arctic Ocean is as close to being on the starship enterprises i think i'll ever get you know you're it was so remote um you had like a science team on board you had the coast guard guys on board so sure it was uh it was really really fun it was a, it was a fun time and then we moved to denver in uh, like 2009 yeah you're like i like this cold where else can i go that gets cold <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> is it is it loud are icebreakers loud yeah, when they're really doing their thing, it can get really loud because they they rev up the engine, so you got a lot of power. Mm -hmm. And then the way an icebreaker works, it actually hits the ice and goes up and over it, and then the weight of the ship comes crushing down on the layer of ice. And then they oh. back up, and they do it again. So you have this whole... Uh, sequence where you you hit the ice and then there's all this this like grating sliding noise and then the crush of the ice and the boat kind of falls back down and uh, uh, and you just continue that for hours on end, man. Like until a you until you yeah until you forge your way uh, through the ice. But uh, that's crazy. But yeah, it was really neat. Yeah, very that's alien cool. landscape. Really, you know, when you yeah. looked around, it's all the frozen surface of the Arctic Ocean. It's just like it's it's pretty surreal. Man, that is nuts. And that's like the that's the dream of like a reporter kind of thing is like getting out there and like not just in oh, the yeah. local area. Like you've seen right. the world. I know you covered the Malaysia flight, which is bonkers. Yeah, yeah. I spent about a month uh between Malaysia and Australia covering uh covering the uh, uh Malaysia three seventy. That's still still a mystery, but um yeah. uh yeah, it was it was really fascinating. Part of that, uh part of those trips was uh, I got to fly with the uh, Royal New Zealand uh, Air Force on a couple of uh, search missions. I mean, we would go out to the middle of the ocean and just crisscross the ocean back and forth while their guys looked out the windows for any sign of of anything. Wow. Of course, we never, of course, we never saw anything, but uh, but sure. it was it was a sort of fascinatingly surreal <laughs> experience to be out there doing it. Yeah, did you throw up? No, I never did. I never did. There you uh, go. Knock on wood. I, I have um, 
I, ha- I have never really gotten motion sick on anything, so uh, that's good. That's I good. hope that continues. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> maintain that title. <laughs> yes, please. Yeah, man, that's crazy. You've done so many cool things. So, what would you say has been the craziest, like? A broad trip, like, oh, wow, I'm actually going to do this. Because looking for a missing plane is pretty bonkers. But then you talk about being in an icebreaker in the Arctic Circle. It's like, how do you – Yeah, what do you yeah. do with I your mean, life, Clayton? I think, um, I think you know, in, in terms of just bonkers, I, I've never really been to a war zone. Um, but, you know, I, I we were – Spent some a couple of weeks in Haiti once when the country was sort of falling apart and the, the president was leaving and uh, – and it just became complete chaos on the streets and people were getting murdered in the streets left and right. And uh, you're kind of looking around going, yeah, do I really want to be here? Yeah, <laughs> sure. <this> particular moment. <laughs> um, Understandable. Yeah, yeah. And we actually uh, – we were on the roof of our hotel one night setting up for um, for a live shot. I was still producing then and I had uh, – a correspondent named Mike Saray with me and Mike was uh was standing there getting his uh getting his microphone on and we were turning on the lights and as soon as we turned on the lights somebody from a nearby hillside just started shooting at us you could just hear Jeez. you could hear the gunshots coming at us and they gunshots that are fired toward you have a particular sound to them and so you know that you need to get out of the way and so we did we kind of scrambled everybody grabbed something and we you know, we were like five minutes away from a live shot and had to grab all the equipment, run it back down to uh, this courtyard that was a little more protected and sure. uh, got it got it set up. And we were able to do the live shot. But we went up there uh, the next morning. And uh, sure enough, I found I found the actual slugs where they had hit the wall <laughs> right next to where we were standing um, wow. that had been smushed together as they had, 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 had hit the wall. Uh, so that was that was a little unnerving. I was I was That's quite true. happy to yeah. uh, to get on the plane when we when that assignment ended. But yeah, we were there for like two weeks. Wow, man! So you've covered natural disasters, you've covered tragedies, you've covered climate stuff, all kinds of things. Is there a difference in how you cover certain stories? Um, yeah, I mean, I think Star Wars is is a good example of that because Star Wars is sort of like my escape, right? Like, same. <clears throat> it's not. It's not covering a, a, a conflict zone. It's not covering a natural disaster. It's not a, it's not a, uh, a, a political scandal. It's not a, you know, anything controversial, right? So sure. where we would be very aggressive at trying to report out whatever whatever hard news story we were working on. Um, Star Wars is a little more fun. You can kind of just Agreed. sit back and relax. You know, it kind of comes to you when when Lucasfilm and Disney want to put something out, and uh, mm-hmm. and you kind of roll with it and have fun with it. And uh, and so so yeah, I mean, my approach is totally different. You kind of have to let that come to you. Although, if you ask pretty much any Lucasfilm uh, publicist, they get way too many emails from me going, "Hey, you got anything? Can we do anything? Can we, is there anything?" So, same. Same. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, so so we do a lot of that, but uh, but that's just that's just fun, and you get to kind of kick back and enjoy that a little bit. Yeah, of course, of course. That's awesome. So what would you say? Actually, you know, I have a question. What is yeah. the difference between a reporter and a correspondent? Um, nothing. It's cool. correspond, correspondent is the fancy network name for reporter. Got it. Okay. And I don't know where that got started. I'm sure <laughs> there's a there's an I etymology like to that to that uh, to that word, but uh, and why they use it. But it does sound I think way it just more efficient. sounds fancier. Yes, exactly. It definitely does. I'm a reporter. Okay, I report. Well, I correspond. Yeah. <laughs> I wow. correspond. That's I want right. a correspondent. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> just sounds like that guy gets a badge. <laughs> it does sound fancy. I, I hear the word correspondent. And I just, you know, growing up, I think of those those uh, tan uh, raincoat, you know, trench coat things. I just yes. think correspondent. <laughs> that's that's the image that comes to mind. So. Of course. Of course. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so having been a correspondent as well as a producer of something, what would you say is harder? Ooh, yeah. Good question. You know, Thank they're, you. they're you. different. They're such different beasts. Um yeah. You know, uh, I actually, I, to me, I have more fun as a as a correspondent uh, because sure. a, a lot of the logistical things that I used to have to worry about, 
Um, now my producer that I work with here in Denver, Connor Burton, or whoever I happen to be working with in the field, um, you know, they get into the weeds on the, on all the logistical stuff and I'm free to concentrate on the reporting and the story and how we tell it and what we need to tell it and all of those kind of things. So, uh, which I enjoy, I enjoy much more. I had a blast as a producer. I really did. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, sitting in the edit room, especially I liked, I liked, uh, it's almost like, you know, you're sitting there working with an editor and it's almost like you're putting together a symphony because you've now got all the pieces that have come in, been fed in from different cities around the world. And, and you've gathered your elements, your graphic elements and all of these things. And you sit there together and, and put this thing together and it's almost like conducting and, and, uh, yeah. it's fun. It's fun cranking out the finished product, but, um, but uh, yeah, I, I love I love being a correspondent. I love being able to get out there and and meet people and travel and tell stories. And uh, you know, it's it goes back to that same old thing. It's I'm still chasing the police cars and the fire trucks. It's just uh, yeah. <laughs> a slightly different slightly different scale. And uh, um, but it's still it's still a lot of fun. Absolutely, absolutely. And then uh, you know, no big deal. You you won an Emmy. That's pretty awesome. Yeah, yeah. I, but it was a team effort. Um, I, it I was always on is. The, yeah, I was on the uh, the team that uh, produced the uh, coverage of the 2009 inauguration of Barack Obama, and yeah. my my assignment was to I was I was down on the west front of the Capitol, down in the audience, and uh, really? so I was responsible for the logistics of of where we had a camera kind of roving around the. Uh, the uh, audience section and we've of course had programming throughout the day. So it was a big special report. Um, sure. But yeah, I was there and, and my job, I was working with uh, Robin Roberts who came in for a couple of hours. She was kind of moving around the Capitol all day, but she came in and, and I was her producer for, uh, for the inauguration ceremony. And so we kind of ran around and tried to find people in the crowd uh, to talk to. And, uh, uh, it was it was great. It was a really neat moment in history to kind of to to witness that, yeah, uh, and to be a part of it um, on, on a national broadcast like that was was really fun and uh, and getting to work with Robin was great. I mean, Robin is the best, she and is. Uh, and uh, it was it was a real privilege. That's pretty bonkers. That like that you get in there just as like the tide turns, you know. Yes, exactly. <laughs> like you get yep. there in two thousand, yep. and then you're there for the inauguration of Barack Obama, which is in itself historic. Like, so I have yeah. to ask. I wasn't there. Like, what was it like there? Because I, I mean, I've seen the pictures. The tons of people. Yeah, there was there was a real. Uh, it was the the energy in the air was just. Um, as cold as it, first of all, it was freezing cold, <laughs> and There's we were all we team. were all yeah we were all uh, we, we, you know had hand warmers in every pocket and <laughs> all over. But uh, but the the energy the excitement uh, in, in the air was was really great. I think um, it, it was just neat to witness. Everybody seemed to be in a in a pretty good mood, and and there was a sense of of hope and renewal and just change and and getting to witness. You know this handover that uh, is is the hallmark of our of our republic was was pretty cool to see that. Uh, yeah. yeah, it was it was kind of an electric day. I'll, I'll never forget it. It really does rank up there as one of the uh, most memorable days of of my ABC existence. Really, sure, I can imagine. That's nuts. And I, I like that you brought up Star Wars earlier because you're like the resident Star Wars fan over there, which is pretty great. Yeah, that. That has been that has been fun. Um, You've made it to the promised land. <laughs> I've made it to the promised land. Yeah, yeah. You know, it was really kind of funny because when you know, I'd always been a Star Wars fan, and uh, but you know, it wasn't it was not in the forefront uh, for me like it is like it is today. I think you know, we when I was a kid, I thought Return of the Jedi was the last movie. You know, sure. I watched the prequels. <laughs> sure. Fair. Uh, uh, you know, and I kind of thought, I kind of thought we were done. And then, and then when the announcement came that Lucasfilm had been sold to Disney and there was another movie came in, coming out, it was like, uh, the fandom awakens really. It yeah. was, uh, it was a whole new era for me. And I really didn't at that time think that I would try and cover it or, or make it 
part of my job. I actually um, had never been to a Star Wars celebration. Oh, boy. And so when uh, Celebration Anaheim was was uh, announced, I told my wife, I said, for Christmas, that's all I want. I'm going to get a four-day <laughs> pass and go and and uh, go with my buddy Brian, and we're just going to go and, and hang out and experience Star Wars Celebration. And Good man. That was great. Bought the pass. And then like a week before, um, you know, I reminded my boss that I was going to be out there and and off. And he said, well, you know, if you're going to be there already, you may as well try and do some work there if you yeah, want to. Yeah, press back. And so, yeah, so the, the gear started turning and the light bulb started going and uh, we got um, – we started trying to figure out – what we could do. And I teamed up with a guy from uh, our digital office in New York, Ronnie. And, uh, and so we went to Anaheim and we ended up doing, I really didn't expect this to happen, but we, we ended up doing uh, the day that the big trailer was announced, the chewy were home trailer. Mm -hmm. Um, We ended up doing a, a story on world news tonight. We ended up doing a story on nightline that night. We did a whole bunch of stuff for digital. And, uh, I th- more importantly, I kind of, got to know or start to understand and meet people who were part of this star Wars fandom. And, uh, you know, people I met there, I, in 2015, I still keep in touch with, uh, today. And I think that, um, I was thinking about it the other day. I I have kept in touch with made more friends and acquaintances from covering star Wars than any other story that I've covered in almost 18 years at ABC hands down. Sounds about right. Sounds about right. Yeah, right. Doesn't it? Yeah, it's just that kind of crowd. You know, you, you, you just uh, you just make friends at these things. And, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's the best thing about celebration specifically. It's great. Cause yeah, I, I've been to like several comic cons throughout the state of Florida and whatnot. Yep. But celebration mm-hmm. is is different because everyone's there because they like the specific thing that everyone is celebrating. Yes, and it's like this, yeah, it's good a point. Kindred spirit, like, oh, you're here for Star Wars. Me too. I also love this thing. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know. Spe- so speaking of that, that's actually where I first heard your name was at the uh, the Rogue One thing that you did with the VFX special. Oh yeah, yeah, that was great. Amazing. Yeah, that was. Re- I I had a blast. You know, because I I after. After Return of the Jedi was gone and we thought Star Wars was done, what I turned to was the behind the scenes stuff. So I have every just to my right here on my shelf, I have every ILM book that's ever been written, issues of Cinefx, all these things that uh, talked about uh you know the the the, the visual effects and how the movies were made and uh, just loved that stuff. So to walk into ILM and Lucasfilm and meet some of those people and talk about their traditions. And, uh, it was just, you know, I was, I was like a, you know, 10 year old kid again. It was just, uh, it was, it was really, really incredible. And, um, so we've done, yeah, we've done several, uh, behind the scenes stories with them uh, now since since then. Yeah. It's pretty great that somebody who is a fan of behind the scenes things is now making behind the scenes things. I like that. Yeah. Yep, yep. I don't know if you've had a chance to check out our documentary we did, The Force of Sound. Oh, yes. Um, oh, we're getting there. We're getting there. Yeah, okay. So we'll <laughs> we'll talk about that. But yeah, so so it was really it's really fun. I mean, there's such a great history with with ILM and of course every everybody who is there loves and appreciates the fact that they're there and they love what they do and they're oh, the yes. best at what they do and um sure. and it's fun to see that energy and feed off of it. And everybody just is always I've never been walking through the hallways of Lucasfilm and met run into anybody who's like in a really crappy mood. Like they're sure. always, you know, it's, it's almost like being at Disneyland. Everybody seems to be, uh, seems to be enjoying what they do, which is, which is really fun to see. It's, it's fun to see people enjoy their, their work like that. Sure. I love it. And I always said that like star Wars, Lucasfilm Island is different than the entertainment industry in the sense that, in the entertainment industry, a lot of people are like, you'll find people that it's just a job. You know, I'm doing the work. It's whatever. Sure. Whereas there are fans that are incredibly talented making stuff for fans at Lucasfilm, you know? Yeah, that's a good point. They are uh, – I mean I can't think of anybody really there who's who's not a fan um, yeah. and and who really gets into it and appreciates it. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, it, it's, it is. You're right. I think it is very unique in that in that regard. You know, and, and, and there's also that weird sort of relationship you have in the entertainment industry where – it's like you. It's kind of cool to not be into the thing that you're into, 
You know, like <laughs> Harrison Ford right. did a really good job <laughs> for most of his life. It's like Han Solo, who I, whatever. Yeah, it's a movie. It's yeah. like, you know you're Han Solo. Sit down. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that's know? right. And that's why he's that's a movie right. star. But but I, I, I love that, like, I mean, Rogue One was a, was a game changer in the sense that, like, Peter Cushing's been dead since, like, 92. And then you see Tarkin turn around in the movie, and it just... I remember oh, being yeah. in the theater. I thought they were going to just play it like, you know, because you first see him in a reflection of the window. That's right. I was yep. like, okay, well, that's what we're going to do, and I'm totally cool with that. But when he turned around, I was like, what is happening? It's yes. crazy. Crazy it's, what they can do. It's crazy what they can do. And what was interesting, you know, there was a lot of, like, uh, uh, a lot of folks who, of course, tried to nitpick it and take it apart. But w- the only reason you were able to do that is if you knew Peter Cushing had passed away. And I asked my daughter who at the time was 13, no 12 uh, when that movie came out and I, and I watched her face during that scene and then I stopped the movie and and asked her and I said, what did you think of that guy? And she's like, what are you talking about dad? Why'd you stop the movie? What's the big deal? And I said, (laughs) did you, did you realize that that guy, that character was completely digital? She had no idea. Yes, that's she had amazing. No, no idea, and you know, maybe, maybe repeated viewings, you might catch on to to something. But, uh, but if you didn't know anything about Peter Cushing, I think, I think it, uh, I think they totally pulled it off. Um, Agreed. Agreed. And uh, and that was neat. And I loved the fact that because uh, some of the ILMers have been have been tweeting, and Lucasfilm folks have been tweeting lately about the movie Top Secret. Yes. And I loved the fact that one of the things they did for Rogue One is John Knoll went and tracked down this uh, face cast that had been made of Peter Cushing for the movie Top Gun. Yep. Uh, top, top Top Secret. Secret. And, uh, and, and found this, this cast, and they brought it back to San Francisco and put it under a scanner. And voila, you had a, you had a, a very faithful recreation of uh, – Peter Cushing's face circa 1984 or whenever that movie came out. Yeah, um, yeah. So, so that was really, that was really cool. So it's just all sorts of, you know, fun history, things like that, that, uh, the, the, it was like that story that we did for nightline was really kind of a, it was like my version of a Cinefix article, you know, yeah, we, were, of course. we were trying to kind of do a, do a TV version of that. And, uh, and uh, yeah, it was just kind of a dream come true to walk in there and meet, you know, Nigel Sumner and John Knoll and uh, Paul Giacopo and all of these people that uh, are just incredibly talented um, oh, at, yeah. at what they do. Dude, John Knoll invented Photoshop. Like <laughs> these things, these people yep. have accomplished. It's insane. Yeah. Oh, Photoshop. No big deal. Yeah. yeah. You know, you com- may have heard of it. Completely. Yeah. You may have heard of it once. <laughs> yeah. That guy made it, you know, it's whatever. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then you just did a playing special... around on his computer. <laughs> yeah, I know. You know, I wonder what this button does. Creates Photoshop. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Then you, um, end up, you ended up doing a special on. So I'm, I am very intrigued as well with behind the scenes and how stuff is made. And that's kind of another thing that I've turned my show into is like trying to give a microphone to people who don't normally get it to tell their side of the story. So I've had like yeah. I've had a lot of creature performers on because I'm obsessed with creatures. Right. Um, yeah. And cool. equally so. Foley. And yes. I think Foley is right. incredible. It's one of the greatest arts in cinema. It's half of it. And your Force of Sound documentary was amazing. Wow. Well, I loved it. I really appreciate that. We um, we worked for about a well, almost a year to try and actually get in there to shoot that. You know, we'd been I'd been talking to uh, the Lucasfilm about doing it for a while, but the trick is always, and, and I totally get this, but you can't really do anything in advance of a movie coming out because yep, learn that the hard way. They want to they want to <laughs> protect. Yeah, you know, of course they they don't want they don't want to they don't want to spoil anything, um, and so it's it's very difficult to get in and do anything in advance. So after the Last Jedi came out, uh, we were finally able to get in there and uh, and and go up to to Skywalker Ranch and go to Skywalker Sound and and go in and. And get kind of a master class in sound design from the best in the business. And what to- what I loved about the Foley team is that, you know, you know in theory what Foley is, right? You know, it's the knocks on the door. It's the footsteps. It's the doors closing. It's mm-hmm. uh, all, all of these, these sounds. And you figure, well, 
40 years into Star Wars, they've probably got every sound they need in a library sound there, which to an extent is true, but there's always that new spaceship or that new weapon or that new whatever that mm-hmm. uh, that they need to, to recreate in either come up with a new sound. Um, but even the things like the footsteps, the Foley team that we met, Ronnie Brown and Margie O'Malley and uh, and all of those guys, they that is a a a true performance for them this isn't just this isn't just making a noise recording it you know copying and pasting into the timeline to match every footstep it is so thought out and they give so much uh consideration to the right surface that those footsteps have to be on it's not just the characters walking on gravel, it's got to be the right kind of gravel and it's got to have the right kind of sound. And they were particularly proud of the work that they had done, for example, uh, with Ray um, on uh, Octo where, you know, she's walking across stone and then dirt and then grass and all of these things in the same scene. And they really put a lot of thought and effort into exactly the right sound and how to perform it just right. And, uh, yeah, you know, that's that's top to bottom. The whole the whole sound design team is like that. It's just like the A plus cream of the crop, you know, talent that puts all of that stuff together. And it is it is so impressive to see how the machine works, you know. Yeah, it's so cool. Like I remember the one artist was talking about uh someone asked, Do you ever do lightsaber noises? She's like, Yes. Every time they pick <laughs> one up or put it that's down. That's right. <laughs> That's right, and it's a uh, it's a very specific set of sounds, and it's it's not just uh, you know. Again, they have like certain things that they one one of the things I'm going to try and do uh, that we didn't use is uh, they showed me they have this thing in the foley room called the Franken gun, what? And it looks like yeah, it looks like what you would imagine. It it looks like half. Like a third of like an AK-47, a third of like the back end of an M-16 or something, and then uh, they've got other parts that are sort of taped and and uh, taped onto it, like the the barrel of a certain gun. Like it's this crazy looking thing. Uh-huh. But what that is, that is every time a trooper, you know, moves his blaster or somebody picks up a blaster or drops a blaster or whatever it is, it's the Franken gun. Uh- <laughs> So I'm going to try I, – I have some unused material that we're, we're trying to put together, hopefully for like May the 4th, that, uh, that we'll release uh, ho- hopefully some extra snippets of that. But we kind of walked through the Foley room, and I had them kind of show me every little, every little object and what it was for and why. That's so cool. Uh, so, yeah, yeah, the Franken gun was, was pretty cool. But uh, That is they great. Just, uh, they just do everything there. And, and the other thing that, that blew me away about the Foley room – that that they did uh, both Rogue One, um, The Last Jedi, Rebels. Uh, they just did Solo in this same room. You know, I I've seen different Foley stages, and some of them can be very big. And they do have a very big one um, at Skywalker Ranch. But this particular room was quite small. It was probably twenty by twenty feet. Really. Um, and all of the sounds were done in this very small room. I was so impressed with how they were able to um, make this room work for them. Uh, they had, you know, computers set up that they would walk on. That was the surface of the walking through the Millennium Falcon. And then over on the side was where they were doing the fathiers uh, clopping around on the dirt. So it was really, uh, it was really fascinating to see how they got all of those different sounds out of such a tiny room. Sure. That I mean, that's when you know you're working with the best of the best, like you said. Oh, incredible. Yep. That's so neat. And then sticking with your theme of being cold and doing cool things, you went to Ireland recently. I did go to Ireland, yeah. I saw yeah. your coverage. Uh, had, it was great. Had never had never uh, been to Ireland before, and, you know, if you're going to go to Ireland, you may as well go on St. Patrick's Day weekend. And that's right. You may, you may as well go uh, with a guy named Mark Hamill. Yeah, you know, if you can. <laughs> if you can, if you can make that, if you can make that work, you yeah. you do your best to <laughs> try and do that. Travel schedules, as you do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, combine travel schedules. Um, so that uh, how was that, that was that was great. It was it was it was amazing and uh, also nerve wracking because it's like that old adage, you know, you never want to meet your heroes, right? Like, I hear you. I, I was I was very nervous about spending time with him and and. 
uh, you know, I just didn't know how it was going to go. Like every indication that I'd had was that he's he's a great guy. I had met him briefly once before, mm-hmm. uh, but had never interviewed him. And um, and so, but, you know, I, I was nervous. I was nervous leading leading up to that. And he and his his wife and his daughter, Mary Lou and Chelsea, they could not have been nicer, could not have been more gracious, could not have been more generous with their time. It was uh it, it was it was great, and uh, we we spent uh, a couple of days with him in Ireland. We we did a big interview with Mark one day, and then sort of a smaller interview with uh, with his wife and daughter, who traveled the world with him. Chelsea works as his his daughter works as his uh, assistant mm-hmm. on the Star Wars films, and uh, and they travel they they travel the world together all all over, and uh, it's kind of fun. Sure. This this trio that that goes around the world, but uh, but it was great. I think one of the the highlights of it was uh, we we had done the interview the previous day, and then uh, the second day we were together was the actual day of the um, Dublin St. Patrick's Day Festival parade, and we he of course knew knew we were coming, but we had arranged to have some time to chat with him. Uh, as he was in the car rolling down the parade route and we started to walk up and we kind of made eye contact and he goes, Hey Clayton. And I thought, what? Oh my God, he remembered my name. <laughs> <laughs> Luke Skywalker called you by name. Luke Skywalker called me by name. And a, a buddy of mine from like kindergarten, my, my buddy Dennis said the same thing. He said, he said your name as you walked up. It was like, <laughs> This crowning achievement in uh, in in Clayton's life, so uh, it, it was really uh, it, it was sort of again uh, this one of these just pinch myself kind of kind of moments. Um, but yeah, we turned we turned uh, we did a, a big Good Morning America piece out of that, and uh, and a digital piece with with Mark and his and his wife and daughter, which was neat to kind of hear from them because you don't you don't get to hear from them very often sure sure and uh and like i said they just had some great insights into into life in the hamill family and and carrie fisher and what it's like to to be together on these travels so it was uh it was pretty darn incredible i gotta say sure sure i've seen all the coverage it was great speaking of someone who also asked questions of their heroes what do you think is the key to getting information out of someone in not a weird way? <laughs> like, because you asked the perfect question out of every other reporter to see if you can kind of get him for episode nine, and I was like, "That's a man who knows what he's doing." <laughs> I, was uh, like, I just wrote goals. <laughs> yeah, you know, exactly. Um, that was, uh, you know, I think we we were just kind of trying to have a little fun. That that. Part of the the interview, I had actually been asking him about mostly about being in Ireland and um, and and what it was like to to be back in Ireland and to be in the, you know the the guest of honor in this parade. Mm-hmm. And it would you know it came, came out of a mono, a mono. It's like all right, we just we just have to have some fun here and let's let's just lay it on the line and and see go. what he says. And uh, it was funny if you you watch the clip where I kind of lean into the car and I'm talking to him and I kind of I intentionally put him on the spot and my my buddy said you were like you were like hitting him on the shoulder as you were asking that question i i didn't even realize it but i went back and looked at it and was like oh yeah it was kind of like come on like get it you know mock pounding him on the shoulder like, give me an answer hamill that's right yeah uh, <laughs> but uh yeah you know it's funny it's 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 really tricky because i'm not an entertainment reporter right so sure. i'm not i don't do a lot of i don't i don't go to junkets really ever um I, I'm a, I'm a hard I cover hard news ninety five percent of the time so right uh, so it's it's an interesting thing for me to kind of then put myself into this mode of of entertainment reporter but also trying not to do the same kinds of questions that you do in a junket and uh, trying to trying to trying to really hone in and get to the heart of the matter on, on something. And, uh, sure. So yeah, each one is a little bit different. Um, good point. So actually as somebody who's been doing this for such a long time, what is one big thing that you've learned over your career thus far? You have to be, you have to be, I I think just sort of, Fearless in the sense that you have to just uh, absorb and embrace 
everything because that's the only way to really ha- have empathy for all sides of a story. I mean, you can have your own, you can have your own political views and your own personal views on something, um, but the best, most honest storytelling is when you just kind of open yourself up to, you know, you're really just trying to find the truth of something. Sure. And uh, I, I find you just have to be, at the end of the day, open-minded and fair uh, and cast aside or, or you, whatever, whatever personal bias you might have for a particular topic. Uh, one of my mentors, uh, Bill Blakemore, a retired correspondent now, but he, he said, you know, obviously he, reporters are uh, human. They, we, we, we've all got our our implicit bias and, and you know, things, the way we grow up, all of those things. And he says, you know, the, the trick is not to pretend you're a robot and that you don't have uh, a bias on something, but you have to embrace it and use that and say, all right, be honest with yourself. Here's my particular viewpoint on something. Now work extra hard to make sure that the other side is represented. So it's just it's it's being open minded and fair at the end of the day. Like as I tell people who I, we do stories on, you may not like the story we do. It it might be a story about how you've screwed something up or you're in trouble with the law or whatever it may be. Mm-hmm. Um, you may not like the story, but what hurt what would what would hurt me more is if you think it wasn't fair. We all always try to be be fair and uh, uh, with our stories and give everybody their say. So. Sure. Uh, you I know, think that's just really find, important. Finding that balance, yeah. Sure, I'm right here. Uh, that's really, really important, I think, and that's great to hear from you know a news source as well. Um, what advice do you have for anyone who wants to do what you do to get into your kind of field? News in general, sure. <clears throat> yeah, uh, you know, um, I think obviously uh, know know the business go if if you live in a town big or small and you want to know um you, you know a lot of times it's like you got to pull the curtain back a little bit and get past sort of the theory of a job and a lot of times <laughs> go find somebody who does it and try and shadow them and see if you can spend some time with them to see how it actually is day to day and if you're going to if you're going to like it, um, sure. I always I always recommend people reach out to people who are doing what they want to do because almost uh, all of us enjoy to a certain extent talking about what we do and how we got there and um, mm-hmm. and the people the people that helped us along. That's you know I, I didn't get anywhere on my own. I I had help. I had people that took took chances on me that had no reason to really <laughs> sure. other than they saw some potential in me I guess, but. Uh, you know, and and I think there's a lot of people out there willing to help impart their their knowledge to uh, to do it. And then you know, you can go to school. I I did not go to school to be a journalist. Like like you said, I was a poli sci major, and uh, but knew I kind of wanted to work in this field. I personally, since that was my path, I don't think you have to go to a journalism school necessarily. There would be others that disagree with me, but um, mm-hmm. I think you can you can get any good liberal arts education and. Uh, and learn the journalism part of it um, uh, all, along the way. Um, like I said, there were people who would consider that blasphemy, I guess. But, um, <laughs> but that was my path, and there's plenty of other people like me that have done it that way. So um, I'm sticking to that story. Sure. I love it. I, I, if there's one thing that I've learned uh, interviewing, I think, 50, 53, 54 people now, it's that wow. there's, there's a million different ways to success. And even in the same end point, there's no, oh, yeah, there's no sure. select path. And even if you do the, like, the main path, it doesn't mean it's going to work the same way for everybody. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely right. I couldn't agree with that more. Crazy, crazy times. Well, I've used up just about an hour <laughs> of your time. This is fun, man. This was a great time. Yeah, yeah. I'm glad I uh, we made it work. I, I hope to do it again. I can, I can ask you about uh, your 501st and Rebel Legion stuff. Yeah, anytime. If you ever want to come back, you got my info now. Let's do that. Yeah, yeah. Let's do oh, that. For show, for fun. show. Um, so, where can people find you online? Uh, people can find me online. Probably Twitter is the most. I'm. I. You know, I could be better at Twitter, uh, but Twitter <laughs> is probably the best place to find me. It's at Clayton underscore Sandell. Um, and then, uh, you know, you'll see, you'll see me on Good Morning America and World News Tonight and Nightline, uh, depending on what's going on. So. 
uh tv and twitter are, are the main <laughs> it's both ends of the things. spectrum <laughs> yeah exactly i love it i love it that is great and Hello, friends. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of uh, The Interesting Podcast. Uh, if you want to follow me on Twitter, it's at Jedi Brian. If you want to follow the show, it's at Pod of Interest on Twitter. And uh, if you enjoy this, uh, if you wouldn't mind, go to iTunes and give it a five-star rating. That pushes us to the front of uh, the iTunes algorithm, and it helps book guests. Um, yeah, so I really appreciate you listening. Until next time, be well.